Hi, I'm Laura Flanders, and this is CityWorks, a program by, with, and about workers and working in New York City. This month, name two pieces of legislation passed in 1965 that are most responsible for the complexion of today's U.S. Here's a hint. One is the Voting Rights Act. We're going to talk about the other with Deepak Bhargava. He's a longtime community organizer and a distinguished lecturer here at the School of Labor and Urban Studies at CUNY. The school hosted an event earlier this year about progressive immigration policy. It was called Beyond Resistance Towards the Progressive Agenda for 2020. And we're going to have highlights of that conference and a sit down with Bhargava on this month's program. City Works is a co-production of the School of Labor and Urban Studies at the City University of New York and CUNY TV. The U.S. immigration system has created a crisis for workers, raiding workplaces, even residencies, and weakening labor standards on the job. What would a more progressive agenda look like? That was the topic of an event held here at the School for Labor and Urban Studies with the title Beyond Resistance toward a progressive immigration agenda for 2020. Here are some highlights. Most of our, uh, our district is predominantly immigrant, very diverse. And so a lot of the casework that we see is immigration related. So one of the pieces or, or one of the parts of the casework that we, that we see is we have seen a lot of families being separated due to the Muslim ban due to this travel ban where if you are from certain countries, you're not allowed to be here, right? So immediately as, as we see how these practices, these very racist practices are being put in place, we're seeing how they are separating people. I can tell you the story of a mother and her husband is in Yemen. They are married, they have two children. The husband has been in Yemen for a few years now, waiting for a visa to come reunite with their family. Um, and, what, and so what our job is, our job is to contact immigration services and ask, why is this happening? The answer that we get for Muslim ban cases is administrative processing, which I know it means nothing to you, it means nothing to us. Because what administrative processing means is just they're looking into it and they're gonna get to it when they, they're gonna get to it. And so you have a lot of people, but imagine being that woman whose two children are depending on her, who want to see their father, whose father is in Yemen, who has been waiting to reunite with, with her family. And all she knows is we can't be together because of administrative processing. We see that again and again. Another type of casework that we see, and we have seen it, I remember this family coming to our office. Um, it was a 19-year-old and a 13-year-old. They come to our office, There's, they come because their father has been detained. Uh, their father has been in the country for more than 20 years. Uh, their, their father has been regularly going to check in with ICE. Um, but this time, what ICE, and every time that, that, that he's gone before, he checks in and he comes out. And all other previous administrations decided not to remove, not to deport this person back to their home country because his only violation is an immigration violation. But he has a family here, he has a job here, he has demonstrated what great character he has. And yet, this administration, during his last check-in, decided that they were gonna deport him. They gave him zero notice. The family didn't even think this could happen because they had been going through this so, for so many years, for decades. So the dad went in, got detained, the family after, you know, like after he didn't come home that night, they started worrying. The daughter, the 19-year-old daughter, is in upstate New York going to college. The 13-year-old daughter is here with mom, and they don't know what to do. So eventually they come to our office because what, what the daughters tell me they did is they had a family meeting, and they're like, what do we do? We have no idea. They felt disempowered. They are freaking out that their father's going to be deported. And all they could think of was, well, there's the congresswoman, right? She said she can help people. So they went all the way from the Bronx. Well, first the 19-year-old daughter came from upstate New York, came home, then they went from the Bronx to Queens to talk to us, and they come to our office, and both daughters are shaking, both daughters are telling us what happened. Uh, they can't believe that this has happened, and they don't know what to do. Now, lucky for all of us, um, the first thing that they needed was an immigration attorney. Now, one of the things that I did previous to this role at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, my job was to be able to provide access to immigration legal services. The city of New York has many of such programs that they fund 
so that immigrants here can have that access. So because I knew that, I was able to make that phone call, figure out who an attorney would be so that they could connect with the family, right? And so then that attorney, and, and you know, that attorney is somebody who I knew who's done this type of cases because also these type of cases are not simple cases. These are very complicated cases. So they got on it and then they were able to make sure that the, that the, that the father was released. Now what, when the father explained what happened to him, is that they picked him up and they said, we're gonna put you on an airplane, you're going back to your country. The father courageously said, I am not going back. When they tried to put him on that plane, he said, I'm not going back, and he made a scene. And at that moment, immigration services decided we're not gonna, we're not gonna push this because we don't want bad press, right? But imagine having that courage. Imagine, and he said, I'm not going back because my children are here, because my family needs me. Imagine having that desperation and just saying, it doesn't matter what's happening, I'm just gonna make sure I'm like, I'm on the floor, I'm not going anywhere. But not everybody is able to do that, right? Not every 13, 19 year old is able to think about, let me go to my congresswoman and they can help me. One of the things that this administration decided to do was end something called temporary protected status, which covered many immigrants here who had been here because of a natural disaster in their country, or because there was war, or because of something that they couldn't help, and so they had to come here, and we decided that because of humanitarian reasons, we were gonna allow them to stay here. And I can tell you, in terms of TPS, my husband is somebody who's protected by TPS. And my husband is here, right there uh, in the audience. And <laughs> he has been in the country for more than 20 years. When we met, I was in law school. Um, when we met in law school, he immediately told me I had TPS. And it was weird to me because I'm like, okay, then so what? You know, like, my name is Maribel and you have TPS. Uh, <laughs> uh, and what he said from the beginning, he said, well, you know, it can end at any time. And what I told him was, no, it won't. It's been, it's been re, reissued every 18 months. It was reissued. And it was reissued, why? Because the conditions in his home country, Honduras, are still dangerous. You go back, and, and there have been many people who have been sent back, and they go back to die, right? So many administrations, Republican, Democratic, they have reissued this temporary protected status, not only for Honduras, for El Salvador, for Nicaragua, for Nepal, for Tibet, not Tibet, sorry, for Nepal. Um, and so what, what happened under this administration? For Haiti, under this administration, they decided that they were gonna end these programs, and why? There is evidence that the reason why they did it, it was because of racism. It was because the people who were being protected by these programs were people of color. And so we have in our district, New York 14, many people who are protected by TPS, protected by DACA, right? The young children who came here, who came here and then they heard of DACA, that was a great hope. And they said, okay, now I'm gonna you know, continue my studies, I'm gonna go to work. But now under this administration, all of that is in limbo. They don't know what's gonna happen to them. That is not who we are as Americans. That is not who I thought we would ever be seeing, but that's what we're seeing. Another group of people that we've met with in our New York 14 is we have met with undocumented immigrants who served as responders during 9-11. These are people who put their lives on the line when this country needed them, right? And so they went and they selflessly worked there. What is happening to them right now? I can tell you the story of our constituent who cannot speak right now, who cannot walk. He lives on a third floor apartment. To be able to go downstairs, he needs to be carried by a family member or a friend. What happens to him, to him most of the time? He's at home. He has a wife and a six-year-old child. We met with that family. What the child said to us was, can you help my dad? Because I would really like to go to the park. Because, because my dad is in his condition, my mom stays at home all the time. So when I come back from, from school, I stay at home. We cannot even go to the park. A six-year-old child cannot even go to the park because of the condition that her father is in because of the immigration status. If you think about what is underneath all of this, uh, in 1965, we had a revolution in social policy on two fronts that really changed the complexion of the country, the political complexion of the country. The first 
was the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which enfranchised African Americans and changed the electorate of a country locally, nationally, in profound ways, the effects of which are still visible every day uh, in our politics. The second less usually talked about change is the 1965 immigration law, which ended racial quotas and enabled people, including my family, to come from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America in much larger numbers. The political results of those two things, the Voting Rights Act and the 1965 Immigration Act, are dramatic. So there is no President Obama without the 1965 revolution. Right? He got 39%, I will always say this to people, 39% of the white vote. That was his high mark. Right? There is no President Obama in 1970 or 1975 or 1960. It was a consequence of that revolution. So the entirety of this agenda, of the Trump immigration agenda, can be understood as an effort to restore a racial order that began to be undone by the 1965 uh, laws, the Voting Rights Act and the in Immigration Act. So it's not just a knee-jerk reaction. It's not just kind of personal animus or hatred. It's the strategic use of policy and the bully pulpit by the President of the United States and the entire apparatus of the federal government to undo that demographic revolution in the country, to change the country from being on track to be majority of color uh, by 2040 or 2045. And in that frame, immigration is the leading edge, but it's not the only thing that's being done. The effort to undermine voting rights for people of color, and especially for African Americans, is part of that strategy. The effort to mess with the census in all kinds of ways to make sure that uh, people of color, youth, vulnerable populations are not counted and therefore are not represented is part of that same strategy. Um, so some people think that demography, demography is destiny. That is to say that uh, the fact that the country is becoming browner over time means that white nationalism can't work as a kind of political strategy. I think that is disastrously wrong. It is actually possible to use the lever of government, levers of power of the federal government to restrict who participates, who can join, be a member of society, who can immigrate, who has voting rights in a way that disproportionately preserves or restores, depending on your perspective, this uh, racist social order. In the history of our country, we have never seen a man get elected, not just recently, ever, whose political campaign was completely framed around immigration. And not only did he win on that campaign, he actually kept his promise and has implemented everything that he could to keep that promise. When people say that the Trump administration was full of disarray on issue of immigration, it's completely in array. And it's because it had a playbook that it came with, uh, sort of engineered in the office of Senator Sessions when he was the senator from Alabama and implemented by his chief of staff, Steve Miller, at the White House. And they have they had a plan about putting statutes, uh, regulations, internal office memos, staffing priorities with that to make sure their plan would be implemented. And that has obviously worked out. Secondly, we always, as Deepak pointed out, we know that the president has broad powers on immigration. We simply just don't recognize that. That historically, all courts have recognized that there's a lot of executive authority in immigration. It's considered akin to foreign policy. But no, administra no administration has gotten it more tested than it has gotten in this administration because they have never used their executive authority to the hilt that they have used, which also means that advocates are bringing, challenging every action that the president implements going all the way to the Supreme Court, which means more new law in executive action is getting framed every day. Now, those of us from the travel ban days, we all thought that the courts are going to be the bulwark of opposition to this president. That's all true at the federal court level, even at the appeals court level. But by the time these cases have gone to the Supreme Court, the dust has settled, and the Supreme Court has essentially reaffirmed the huge amount of executive authority that the president has. The third thing on this is that 
your power increases if you have no shame. I mean, a lot of other presidents in the past have recognized their power. And they basically said, we can't do that. I mean, I can personally tell you that both the George W. administration and the Obama administration thought about the policy of zero tolerance and thought they knew that zero tolerance was going to lead to separation of kids from their families that we can't do that. So other administrations have said, even if we can do something, we are not going to do it for all kinds of reasons that they found challenging. This presidency has no shame, so therefore the power increases immensely. And the last thing I want to say about this thing, with Deepak Chach on much, much of that, and so did Maribel. We can talk about a number of things this administration has done, from public charge to censors and all that. But to me, the most, two most important things which will have enduring impact. Uh, one is obviously what's happening at the interior enforcement. That by changing the priorities, everyone, by, by Homan, his ICE director, making the critical statement that all unauthorized people should look over their shoulders now. Now, you can't get more retail than that in fear. That even in blue states like New York and California, people are scared that if they leave their home in the morning, they may not come back and see a child. Now, that is the level of fear that only you can appreciate if you are unauthorized or have a family member you're not. The rest of us really cannot comprehend the level of fear. And he has really entrenched that fear in the community. But, but to me, the most important thing is that how he has completely changed the modern asylum system. That asylum system is one of the most important elements of our message to the world. We were founded on the concept of refuge and asylum as a country. We have tried to be the beacon of hope for the rest of the world so that they could pe take people who are persecuted. And the modern asylum system, as we know it, has essentially almost ended under the Trump administration. By series of changes we have made at the border, from metering to sending people back in Mexico, to now the most important is that the transit country rule, that you're not even eligible to apply for asylum if you came through a transit country and did not apply there, essentially makes everyone unqualified. This whole July 4th, when ben, many of us were trying to celebrate the independence, he was issuing statements, there were going to be big raids all over the country. No raid happened. He was talking about Muslim ban, and not a major single Muslim country in the world was affected by the ban. But in terms of the narrative of the people, that made a huge difference, which is sort of what made people think that America is no longer a country that welcomes immigrants. And that, as Deepak pointed out in the Indian case, is going to harm us for a very long time. We need to have a conversation in our movements about the long-term immigration policy that we envision as a society. So we've mostly been focused on the urgent need to fight back against all of the horrible things that have been done by this administration. But what is the immigration policy that we want to see? How many people do we admit every year? Under what conditions? For what reasons? Um, these are really, really deep and profound questions that we should be engaging. Um, so I think that getting the answers right to that set of questions about our future immigration vision is going to be the axis on which our larger political project for social justice, economic justice, and racial justice will turn in the 21st century. So nothing could be more important. We know exactly what the Democrats are against. It's to undo everything Trump has done. But we don't have a plan for what do you do in terms of an affirmative strategy. And the problem with not having a plan for day two is that the problems that we are confronting on immigration predate Trump. The number of things that we have to really confront have only been made worse by Trump, but they have been endemic to us for quite some time. And only I highlight only two of those. The asylum issue. There is an asylum crisis. To say that this is a made-up crisis by the president at the border would be to really deny, deny the truth. There are a large number of Central Americans who would like to come to the United States. A recent study showed that about 75% of Salvadorans would like to come to the United States if they have an opportunity. So there's going to be a pressure for asylum no matter who the president of the United States is. If we don't reform our asylum system, which essentially quickly we can get more into it in the debate, 
which guarantees quick asylum to people who deserve it, but also leads to removal of people who don't deserve it, we're not going to have a credible asylum system that the rest of the country can live by. Second is the legal immigration system. Again, talking about, we talk, people who are sort of feel pessimistic about our immigration, we still admit one million people a year as permanent residents. That has not changed even under Trump. That number actually hasn't gone down. So the legal immigration of one million people will probably stay there. The issue is, who is uh, how do we distribute the one million people? Is it more on the basis of family, which is what now historically is, which leaves only 5,000 visas available for people in low-skilled occupations, which then gives rise to unauthorized people because there are no legal avenues for people to come. Those are really hard facts that all of us have to confront, and the Democratic Party, especially the presidential candidates, themselves will have to confront as we go to day two. Thank you so much. So there you have it. Deepak Bhargava, one of the panelists you just saw at the Beyond Resistance Conference, is with me right here in our office. He joined the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies earlier this year, where he is now a distinguished lecturer. But that comes after many years, 18, I think, heading up the Center for Community Change, a nationwide community organization that we'll hear more about. So Deepak, um, Thanks for your presentation. That was important stuff. That, that history, I don't think, is well understood, going all the way back to 1965. Why did you decide to, to focus there in your remarks? Yeah, thank you, Laura. And I, I think people don't understand the deep roots of the Trump policy on immigration. So people see these individual terrible things that take place, family separations at the border or the Muslim ban. And it seems like a string of hateful actions, but actually underneath, there is a deliberate and calculated political strategy to really roll back the historic gains of the 1960s. It should be obvious, but your comments reveal the potential for very powerful coalitions. Yes. Uh, and finding common cause in the so-called civil rights community with the immigration justice community. Is that happening? Do people build on those alliances in your view? It's one of the great paradoxes of the Trump era. If there is a silver lining, it is that he has unmasked the depth of racism uh, that is still active in this country. And I think he has made different communities of color look at the larger picture, not just the individual harms being done to their own group but to the strategy of racialized politics and dominance that is putting all communities of color behind the eight balls. So you're seeing people begin to turn out for each other, with each other, in a way that I think has not happened previously. So in a way, he's helping to turbocharge a rainbow coalition in this country uh, that includes progressive whites, by the way, as well. Um, and that, I think, is the greatest hope for getting out of the mess that we have uh, right now. How do you go about and how did you go about at the Center of Community Change building those that sense of common interest when we're so effectively pitted at one another by our president, among others? It's a really important question. And it begins by seeing immigration as part of a larger social justice strategy. So native-born workers are hurt when vulnerable, low-wage immigrant workers can be exploited at the job and taken advantage of by employers. And so the first place to start is who benefits from the immigration system we have today? Because it lowers the floor. Exactly. It lowers the floor for all workers. It hurts immigrant workers. It hurts native-born workers. And then you ask who would benefit from a system in which immigrant workers could come out of the shadows join freely with their neighbors to organize, to demand better wages and respect on the job, all workers would benefit. So the, the fundamental place to start is to see immigrant rights as a worker issue, as an economic justice issue, as part of the fabric of what it means to be fighting for social justice, not as a separate issue that just affects immigrants. It's really fundamental. Because there'd be, there'd be more, fewer people who are afraid yes. of taking part in a demonstration, of standing up to the boss, of standing up for their rights, whatever it is. And very practically at the work site, if some workers are terrorized that ICE is going to come if they don't um, agree to being paid less than the minimum wage, 
then that really creates a divide and conquer atmosphere yeah. in which employers can uh, run amok. We also point out to people who benefits when we demonize a whole group of people. Uh, what is it distracting us from? What's the conversation about the concentration of wealth, of inequality, of corporate power? That conversation disappears as soon as we start focusing on people who are uh, extremely vulnerable and poor and marginalized in our society and blame them as the source of our trouble. And that's a light bulb yeah. that goes off for people to say, wait a second, what aren't we talking about yeah. when we talk about this? Deepak Bhargava, he's a distinguished lecturer now at the School for Urban and Labor Studies here at CUNY. So that's it for this month's edition of CityWorks. If you have comments or suggestions, write to cityworks at slu.cuny.edu. For CityWorks, I'm Laura Flanders. Have a great new year. Thank you.